Good afternoon and welcome back for the final briefing in our series of Demo 2 previews. This time we're back with the astronauts who will fly on board the Crew Dragon from Kennedy Space Center in Florida, Robert Bankin and Douglas Hurley. You'll notice that they're our first briefers today to be side by side. They, of course, have been side by side throughout training so they don't have the opportunity to maintain social distance from each other, but we are keeping them isolated here in the room. Uh, Bob and Doug are both veterans of two previous space flights, having been selected as astronauts in 2000. Bob was a mission specialist on STS-123 in 2008 and STS-130 in 2010. And Doug was the pilot on STS-127 in 2009 and STS-135, the final flight of the Space Shuttle program in 2011. They'll now return to Florida together for the first human space flight launch from America since STS-135. We'll let them say a few quick words and then begin taking questions. Reporters on the phone, once again, if you have a question, press star one, and then you can also withdraw your question by pressing star two. And for those at home, we'll take questions via social media. You can send those in using the hashtag AskNASA. So we'll start with Bob for just a few quick words. Howdy and uh, good afternoon. I'm just uh, really excited to be here. Uh, the month that we'll take the SpaceX vehicle, the uh, Dragon 2 uh, space capsule to the International Space Station with a uh, crew on board. Really excited for this uh, NASA and SpaceX mission to bring uh, human space flight back to the Florida coast. It's uh, probably a dream of every test pilot school student to have the opportunity to fly on a brand new spaceship, and I'm lucky enough to get that opportunity uh, with my good friend here, uh, uh, Doug Hurley. I just want to uh, add one piece to that story, which is to just say hello to my son, uh, Theodore. Hi, Theo. Uh, I, I wish you were here to be able to see me today, uh, but in our quarantine, uh, I've just got to, Doug to, to play the part of Theo for me today. So uh, I'll turn it over to Doug. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Bob said, it's a, it's a great honor to be part of this mission. It's uh, just amazing after all this time to be less than a month away from a launch down in Florida. Uh, we're excited to take your questions and uh, just glad to be part of this whole big program. Okay, we will jump right into questions now. We'll take as many as you can. Again, press star one on the phone if you have a question or send them in on social media with the hashtag AskNASA. And we are going to start with Marsha Dunn. Please remember, direct your question to whoever you'd like to answer it. Uh, yes, gentlemen, um, hello. Um, can you hear me? Loud and clear, Marsha. Yeah. Great. Well, how surreal is it for you to be preparing for arguably the, the biggest launch of your lives and uh, everyone's being told to stay home, everyone's separated, wearing masks, gloves. I mean, how weird is that for you? How uh, disappointing is it going to be having to tell your own friends and families to stay far away? Yeah, it certainly is disappointing uh, aspect of all this uh, pandemic is the fact that we won't have you know, the, the luxury of uh, our family and friends being there at Kennedy to watch the launch, but it's obviously it's the right thing to do in the current environment. Um, I guess I would also say that, you know, the last five years for Bob and I working uh, commercial crew and then the last uh, two specifically with SpaceX, it's been a long road to get here. And I don't think either one of us would have predicted that uh, when we were ready to go fly this mission that we would be dealing with this as well. But we just want everybody to be safe we want everybody to enjoy this and, and, and relish this moment in uh, U.S. space history. But uh, the biggest thing is, is we want everyone to just be safe and enjoy it from a distance. Okay, we'll go next to Chelsea Goad from space.com. Hi, Bob and Doug. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, so I actually have a quick question about the manual control of the spacecraft. Um, there is the possibility that you will have to assume some manual control. And I'm curious kind of what you've trained for and what you are expecting just in case something happens and, and, and what you can look forward to and what you guys are ready to do. With that one. I think uh, the Dragon spacecraft ha does have a lot of capabilities for us to intervene manually. I think probably the one that uh, most folks are uh, uh, the most familiar with is actually the possibility to take over and manually fly the vehicle potentially close to space station. Uh, folks probably know that's how we got the space shuttle uh, docked to the International Space Station. Uh, we took over manually and flew those final steps of the mission. But we do have a series of uh, manual capabilities that allow us to uh, really protect protect ourselves if the automation was to have some sort of a problem with it, less of a focus on executing the mission with, uh, with the manual controls. 
Uh, Doug should have the opportunity a couple of times during the flight to manually fly the vehicle with those interfaces that, uh, that kind of drive it around. Um, but we will be uh, probably checking out some of the other manual interfaces that, that we're involved with as well. Doug, I, you have anything to add? Yeah, just as Bob mentioned, you know, we specifically, uh, as part of this test flight, designed in some time with, uh, you know, in the free flight phase as well as uh, closer to space station so we can test out actual manual flying capability of the vehicle and just to see and verify that it handles the way we expect it to and the way the simulator shows it to fly. And uh, I think it's a, it's a prudent part of our flight test just like anything else in case the eventuality happened for a future crew that needed to take over manually and fly the spacecraft. So we're just doing our part to kind of test out all the different capabilities of Crew Dragon. Okay, next we're going to Stephen Clark with Spaceflight Now. Stephen, can you hear us? Okay, we'll come back to Stephen. Uh, let's go to Irene Klotz with uh, Aviation Week. Okay, we may need to give the telecon system a little time to check to catch up. Um, instead, we'll take a question from Twitter. Um, this is from Manish on Twitter asking, what is your advice to those who look up to you and uh, follow want to follow in your footsteps? Uh, what's the best best way to get there? I think both uh, Doug and I and most of the astronauts would give uh, similar advice, which is uh, uh, do uh, your best at all the work that's in front of you, whether it's uh, studying at school or the career that you choose, you really need to, to focus on, on, on doing well at, at those things. And at the same time, finding some uh, uh, part of school that you really have a passion for and enjoy, the same for a job when the time comes to take one. Uh, you definitely do your best when you find something that you have a, a passion about. And luckily for me, I was able to find uh, something in science and something in math that I had a passion for. And that allowed me to you know, really uh, enjoy spending more time at those sorts of things. And so uh, finding that passion and then pursuing it. I think if you go down the path of uh, trying to uh, look at what an astronaut does and just uh, do those specific things and you don't find something that you have a passion and enjoy, it'll be really tough to, to do a good job and, and you know, dedicate the years, the decades in many folks' cases uh, to being successful and becoming an astronaut at those things unless you, you find that spark that uh, really, really makes you happy while you're doing those things. Let's give the telecon system another try. How about Stephen Clark? Yeah, Brandy, can you hear me now? We can. Go ahead. Great. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on the earlier question about the manual flying with uh, Doug. Can you just tell me how the simulation and the training has gone flying with the touchscreen versus uh, flying with a stick for your whole career? Uh, just interesting what strikes you as different, what took some getting used to, and just what that whole thing looks like from a pilot's perspective. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think uh, it was probably on the order of at least five or six years ago when uh, we went out to SpaceX and evaluated a bunch of different uh, control mechanisms for the vehicle, and they were kind of looking at every, every which way of flying the vehicle. And ultimately, they decided on a touchscreen interface. And, and of course, you know, Growing up as a pilot, uh, my whole career, having a, a certain way to control a vehicle, this is certainly different. But uh, you know, we we went into it with a, a very open mind, I think, uh, and worked with them to kind of refine the way that you interface with the, the with the touchscreen and the way that your you know your your touches actually registered on the display in order to be able to fly it cleanly and not make mistakes touching it, and you know potentially just uh, putting in a wrong input, those kinds of things. So it was, it was challenging, I think, for us and for them at first to kind of work through all those, all those different design uh, issues. But we got to a point where the vehicle, um, from a manual flying standpoint with the touchscreen, it flies very well. Um, you kind of interface with the, with the vehicle such that the cameras actually are displayed right on that same display. So you're seeing the docking target, for example, when you're uh, maneuvering close to space station right in the same exact place you're looking to fly the vehicle. Um, the difference is, is you've got to be very deliberate when you're putting an input in uh, with a touchscreen relative to what you would do with a stick because you know 
when you're flying an airplane, for example, if I push the stick forward, it's going to go down. I have to actually make a concerted effort to, to do that with a touch screen, if that makes sense. So it's, it's a little bit different way of doing it, but it, uh, the design in general has worked out very well. I think one thing to add is that the flying task is uh, very unique. Uh, the docking task to come close to space station and fly in proximity and then slowly come into contact is maybe uh, a little bit different than what you would see for flying a space shuttle or flying an aircraft. And so uh, when we evaluated the touchscreen interface, we really did focus on the task at hand and trying to get to, you know, a, a good performance for that specific task. I think. Uh, I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb to say that the, the right answer for all flying is to not switch to a, a touchscreen necessarily, but for the tasks that we have and the capabilities to kind of keep ourselves safe uh, flying close to uh, the International Space Station, uh, the, the touchscreen is going to provide us uh, that capability just fine. Um, it just might not be the same thing you'd want to use if you were suited up and trying to fly an entry or an ascent, for example, like we could do with the space shuttle. Okay, now we will try Irene Klotz again from Aviation Week. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Great. Uh, Bob, I'm wondering if you could please give us a preview of launch day um, from your perspective, starting from when you arrive at the pad about three hours before uh, liftoff. And uh, also, although the issue about fueling once you guys are aboard has been well vetted, uh, do you think that that's going to be a particularly tense time for you guys? Thanks. Um, sure. I, I think our, our timeline is uh, pretty well established. Uh, once we arrive at the pad, uh, Doug and I will take a chance to, to look around at the pad surface, much like we did uh, in space shuttle days, uh, make our way to the uh, crew access uh, level, uh, the crew access arm. There is a, a telephone up there that uh, will likely reach out to uh, a family member from that uh, telephone and, and, and make a call to let them know that we're uh, on the pad and, and ready to launch in space. Hopefully. We get a person and not a, an answering machine when we make that call. Uh, we'll climb into the vehicle, and then with, with the assistance of the SpaceX Sutex, we'll get uh, all strapped in and do our initial comm checks with the, uh, the folks uh, both in Hawthorne and the uh, Launch Control Center uh, in, at Kennedy Space Center as well. Um, after that's complete, there'll be a series of closeouts that that team needs to do. And from our perspective, we'll be taking over the ship. That's when uh, uh, Doug and I will really be in charge of uh, uh, what's going on inside of there, and we'll uh, proceed with operations. At about uh, 45 minutes prior, we'll uh, arm what's called the launch escape system so that that fueling operation can begin. And so I would... Uh, I would say that there certainly is a, a different level of, uh, of nervousness. Uh, um, I think for both uh, Doug and I, nervousness is not the right word. It's a, uh, it's a different level of awareness. Once we get the ejection seat, if you will, armed of the vehicle while it starts the tanking process, and to, to sit on that ejection seat for that uh, 45 minutes through the tanking operation leading up to launch is, a, is something that we're used to doing uh, in airplanes. You know, At some point on the ground, we do need to arm that ejection seat, and, and uh, post-flight, we need to do it as well. It's just a part of the way that we've done business our entire careers, I guess, uh, both in the military um, and now with the, the SpaceX vehicle. And so, again, I wouldn't say that uh, we have nervousness or, or a difference. It's just a part of, you know, recognizing what, what capabilities the vehicle has and what can happen to you at, uh, at any given point. And once we get that system armed up, we'll be ready for uh, ready to go fly. I know folks will look for a T minus zero, but we'll be we'll be ready for it as soon as we, uh, we get that system armed. Okay, next we'll go to Eric Berger with Ars Technica. Uh, hi, I was just uh, looking at the uh, picture uh, from 2011 of the flag on the International Space Station, and uh, I'm wondering what it's going to mean to you. You know, Doug, your 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 patch is already up there, and you're going to be bringing that flag home, and so. I, just wondering if you have any few thoughts and like, will you be doing that the first day or, or what the plan is? Yeah, it's a good question, Eric. Um, you know, I don't know if we've thought about it to a huge degree. I think, you know, the, the plan always was, or at least we thought it would be uh, back in 2011 that the first uh, U.S. vehicle to launch from Florida and come to the uh, International Space Station uh, would, would grab that flag that flew both on STS-1 and STS-135, the first and last flights of the shuttle program. So I think we we will probably uh, 
grab it from Chris uh, and then put it in a safe place uh, while we uh, do our work on board Space Station and then we'll uh, bring it back when we come back later this summer. Let's take one from Robert Perlman with Collect Space next. Hi. Um, thanks. Uh, looking back, uh, well, Jim, Jim Bernstein um, made the point of, of highlighting the fact that this is going to be the fifth U.S. spacecraft to fly crew for the first time. And all five, all uh, four of the prior spacecraft have had touches or um, customizations made by their first crew that have sort of lived the legacy through the rest of the missions. Can I, either of you address something specific that maybe you added, uh, placement of Velcro or the a switch that you that you desired. Was there something that, that it says this was your input into the spacecraft? You want to do that one? I, I think uh, for both Doug and I, our, our goal through this entire process is to uh, not turn the spacecraft into uh, Bob and Doug's uh, excellent machine and uh, with a bunch of things that uh, only Doug likes or only Bob likes. Uh, I, I think we should be pretty proud of kind of the, the whole system. Uh, I think uh, both Doug and I have really focused on trying to make sure we had a, uh, the capabilities to kind of safely intervene from a, a manual perspective for the automation. And so well, there's been a lot of uh, discussion with the uh, SpaceX team. And I think you could probably say every display and every procedure um, that, that is presented to crews in the future is going to have uh, multiple items by both Doug and I. Uh, that that are our inputs and will go forward, and we just are are hoping that uh, they can't see our initials below them. We're hoping that uh, they take them as a hey, that that seems like a good idea, and then they maybe they'll uh, incorporate it and think it was their idea because it was so good. So, yeah, I think you know just to add to that, we back in 2015 when Sonny, Eric, Bob, and I were selected to start out from the astronaut office point of view, working on commercial crew. You know, that was part of that reason was to have multiple astronauts working on both the Boeing and the SpaceX vehicle uh, just for that very reason, not to have some influence such that it's just an individual's preference rather than something that works better for uh, the group that's going to fly this vehicle ultimately. And I think adding to that, you know, this, this spacecraft, Crew Dragon, is SpaceX's design from start to finish. And then make no mistake about that, you know, NASA certainly influenced at times and offered opinions and, and, and both Bob and I were in that same boat with regard to operating the vehicle and flying the vehicle in space. We offered our opinions and suggestions and worked and it was just a huge collaboration. Now, I will say this, that there probably are a few pieces of Velcro uh, in our spacecraft that we're going to fly that we put there and uh, we'll use and, and maybe future crews uh, with their Dragons will you know, use a little bit different Velcro scheme, but we're, we're, Bob and I are a little bit old school in that respect. And, and so there is a little bit of Velcro, hopefully uh, nothing that takes away from how good the vehicle looks. You know, if, if you get a chance, I would encourage you to ask that question of uh, folks that maybe don't have the same blind spots that uh, Doug and I. So, you know, reaching out to the mics or to uh, Laura or the rest of the team out there at SpaceX, Chad, um, the, the suit guys with uh, Chris and Eric and, and, and that crowd, Maria, just to, to see what we uh, insisted on that they could attribute to, to one of us and kind of go forward with. I think we've lost track of uh, whose good idea was what because we've tried to, uh, if Doug said something good, I've tried to echo it so that we could, you know, really get a, a, a consensus on what we were going to get built f going forward. But those guys might be able to, uh, to point out which things really are uh, attributable to either one of us or, or any of us. Next, we'll take a question from Lauren Grush with The Verge. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I'd really love to know what the timeline is like between launch and getting to the station. What will you guys be doing during that time, apart from doing the manual controls? Do you get some sleep in? You know, what are, what are, what do, what's that time period look like for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think currently, uh, if we launch on time, on the uh, 27th, we'll dock uh, the next morning sometime Eastern time uh, with Space Station. And it's on the order of uh, 15 hours, I believe, and uh, or maybe maybe a little bit more. But anyway, it, you know, we launch, we get to orbit, we do um, what we call activation, which is kind of getting the vehicle ready for orbital ops. 
you know, we'll do some other housekeeping type uh, things within the vehicle. We'll get out of our suits, maybe get something to eat, uh, work our way through that, that evening. And, and then uh, we will have a sleep period on board. Uh, the next morning is, you know, wake up, go through the process there of getting the vehicle ready for rendezvous, getting back into our suits, doing leak checks in our suits, and then ultimately flying the rendezvous profile. We will do uh, some manual flying both uh, in the far field, which is early after uh, we launch, and then we'll do some manual flying once we get closer to space station as part of our flight test. I think we talked about that before. And then ultimately docking uh, mid-morning uh, on the 28th. Along those lines, we have a question from Twitter coming in from Human, who is wanting to know what you will eat in the Crew Dragon during Ascent and Descent. Uh, inside the Crew Dragon, uh, what we'll have to eat is, is very similar to the crew on board the International Space Station. Uh, we do have some limitations. We don't have an oven and we don't have a way to add water really to the, the food that we have, so we won't have any rehydrated food. So, you know, for, for a Marine and uh, an Air Force guy who grew up with the Marine father, uh, we'll be uh, eating the MREs and it'll be just like our childhood probably <laughs> or earlier in our career. So we're really just going to eat the thermal stabilized uh, uh, sorts of foods and uh, um, hoping that uh, we still get a reprieve and they get, figure out a way to put coffee on board the vehicle. But uh, as of now, uh, we'll have water in those, uh, those MREs to eat. That sounds luxurious. Uh, yeah. One more from, from Twitter. Uh, this one coming in from R SpaceX. How would you compare your excitement and anticipation prior to this flight to your first shuttle flight? Oh, I think it's uh, very similar in a lot of ways. I think, you know, your first uh, shuttle flight, at least my experience was that it, you, you know, you just don't have any idea what to expect. And, you know, you've worked so hard to get to that point and it's exciting on so many levels. I, I think this this is a little bit more measured in, in a lot of ways because one we've we've been to space before, but we've also worked a very very long time uh, in this collaboration with SpaceX um, to get to the launch pad uh, one. And then the other thing is you just you know you just want to be methodical about everything you do because this is a first flight of a vehicle, and we just want to make sure we've we've you know chased down everything we need to. And uh, along with the rest of the teams, both here uh, at NASA and at SpaceX, to make sure everything's going to go the way we need it to go. I, I think for both Doug and I, you know, with our careers with shuttles launching off the Florida coast, that's probably the thing that's uh, very different from a, a mission perspective. Uh, when we launched on our first flight, it was it was kind of routine to fly from the Florida coast. That was the normal thing. That's what we grew up. I went through, went through school, went through college, went through the early parts of our military careers, uh, seeing that as a normal thing. Uh, now to get the chance to, to bring it back to the Florida coast and to have it be uh, not our first mission, I, I think we have a different perspective of the importance of, of coming uh, to Florida, launching again on an American rocket from the Florida coast, and, and generations of people who maybe didn't get a chance to see uh, a space shuttle launch getting a chance again to see human spaceflight uh, uh, in our own backyard, if you will, is, is pretty exciting to, to be a part of. I, I think that's the thing that's most exciting for me, uh, as well as uh, on my first flight, I was uh, uh, really, I didn't have a, a, a small child, I didn't have a son, and so I'm really excited to share the mission with him and have him have a chance to be old enough at six to see it and uh, uh, share it with me uh, when I get home and, and while I'm on orbit. Absolutely. Next, we'll take a question on the phone bridge from Gina Sinceri with ABC. Hey guys, so we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Apollo this year, and that was a capsule, as you know. And once again, you're flying in a capsule. Would either of you like to talk about the significance of this design that's come around again? As far as the capsule design, Gina, yeah, you were a little bit uh, quiet there for us, but I think you were asking just from the evolutionary standpoint of flying shuttle for 30 years and now going back to a capsule, which is what we flew previously. And I think, you know, from our perspective, a capsule design is a pretty uh, tried and true design. It's a pretty safe design. It gives us uh, abort capability from the pad uh, all the way up into space, which the space shuttle, I think, has been well publicized, didn't have that capability in all phases. So I think from that perspective, um, you know, it's a good thing. Um, it's a reliable design. And I, once again, as we talked about a little bit before, SpaceX um, 
that was the design they chose. If you remember when we were down to three competitors for uh, this contract, the commercial crew program contract, you know, Sierra Nevada was a company that had a, a winged vehicle. So we had two capsules and a winged vehicle. So you can make all those things work. And uh, this is what the design that SpaceX went forward with. And uh, we were certainly excited to fly it. Next, we'll take a question from Mary Liz Bender with Cosmic Perspective. Thank you. Doug, I was curious if you could transport us back to that day in 2011 when you returned from that final shuttle flight. Did you have any idea that the next time you'd fly, you'd be flying commercially? And what was the journey like for you between these two historic flights? Uh, I think, you know, in 2011, when we got back uh, and landed uh, during STS-135, I think for the most part, like I I'm sure Bob would remember, you know, you're exhausted after a shuttle flight. They they work you pretty hard because of the, just the amount of time you can be on orbit and the things you need to get done. So that was kind of my first feeling. And then getting to see, you know, my family uh, was the next priority. But, uh, you know, after that, after the post-flight, I started working essentially in a job uh, in flight crew operations at the time that was supporting commercial crew. And so... By the end of 2011, I was already working, uh, in a sense, on this project. And uh, I, frankly, and you know, the decisions are probably different for every astronaut that flies. I certainly didn't expect to fly again. I certainly didn't necessarily have a plan to fly again. And if I did, it would, you know, have had to have been a case where somebody would have wanted me to, uh, as well as uh, if it was the right decision for me personally and our family. And you know, it just evolved from there. And I, it was about probably five years ago when we were, the four of us were selected for the uh, commercial crew cadre that, you know, I was asked that question if I wanted to fly again, and if so, uh, on a commercial vehicle. And, and at that point, I thought that was probably a, uh, an exciting thing to do and the right thing to do at that point. And, uh, and, and here we are. So I think it's, it has been an it's it's been a long eight and a half or nine years uh, in a lot of ways for uh, the folks that have worked on this program and uh, and then the fact that we didn't have capability to go to space station from the United States and so you know once again I think Bob and I are are, are very uh, humbled to be in this position in order to do that soon. Our next question is from Ivan Carone with AFP. Thank you very much. Can you talk a bit more about how different you think it's going to feel to fly the Crew Dragon compared to the Space Shuttle? And I think Apollo was very noisy inside. Do you know if Dragon will be more quiet for you to sleep? I think uh, our expectation is that, you know, based on our shuttle experience, the first stage was pretty rough and rumbly uh, as well from a noise perspective. Um, we expect Dragon to kind of be um, a little bit of both. We expect it to be smoother. Um, but we also expect it to be a, a louder from a, uh, that initial portion of the of the launch. They uh, did some uh, great work during the Demo-1 mission to include some audio sensors inside the vehicle. And we recently had a, a video put together by the, the team down in Florida on the SpaceX side that combined the video of the ascent of both the Demo-1 mission and the in-flight abort mission with the with the audio. And so that combination of video and audio let us hear all the cues, everything from uh, engine starts and shutdowns to parachute deploys, which was, uh, was, uh, which was a, a really cool thing to be able to see. But I think uh, we're expecting a smooth ride, but we're expecting a loud ride, uh, especially at the, the, the beginning of the mission. And as far as uh, splashing down in the water, um, nobody's done that for a, a little while from the human perspective. And so uh, Doug and I are, are trying to be prepared for, for what Whatever comes with that. We do expect it to be a little bit softer than a Soyuz landing, but definitely harder than a space shuttle landing. And then uh, the ride that we get once we get in the ocean will be one that we'll, uh, we'll tell you about in, uh, in the, in the post-flight uh, press conference. Can't wait to hear about it. Next, we'll take one from Nail Greenfield with NPR. Yeah, hi. Um, so it's been a while since there's been a, a first flight of a vehicle um, you know, 1981 was the first flight of the space shuttle. And I'm just wondering um, if you've been reading about that or thinking about that and how you anticipate this um, 
first test flight of this crew vehicle will be similar or different than what the astronauts experienced on that first shuttle flight back in 1981? I know you just mentioned, for example, that you had audio um, from testing, which I imagine you know, wasn't possible back then. So how do you expect it will be, be similar or different? And then have you also been sort of reading about that or, and thinking about that past event in terms of you know, your place in history with this one? Well, I don't, I don't necessarily think Bob or I have uh, looking, looked at it from maybe a historic perspective uh, just because of all the other things we've needed to focus on. But we certainly you know, remember that. We, uh, we've interacted with uh, both John Young when he was alive. He was here uh, in, the, in the astronaut office for many years, even after we uh, first were selected. So we got to spend a lot of time with John. and. We both know Bob Crippen as well, and and a few years ago, I saw I saw Bob at a uh, an event up in Austin and uh, t talked to him about that specific event. And you know, he he passed on the things that that probably uh, didn't surprise me. Both Bob and I have the background in flight tests, so we've kind of been through some of these initial flights or early flights of uh, aircraft. And you know this was similar, albeit on a bigger scale, and and maybe from a complexity standpoint, uh, more complex. But I think those things are are similar. Uh, and I think one thing that really registered with me with what uh, Bob Crippen said was, you know, we were so focused on, you know, flying the mission, flying the vehicle, and executing, and not making a mistake, and doing all those things, and that. That resonates huge with anybody who's ever been an astronaut. You know, you, you, you have to go in it knowing as much as you can about the vehicle and the procedures and what you're doing, and being as hyper focused as you can be to make sure all this work and effort uh, is successful. And and that's I think the way we're going to approach it. And then, you know, from the historical perspective, we'll let somebody else talk about that. And uh, when we get back. Now we'll take a question from Paul Brinkman with UPI. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, Bob, you, you had talked about, uh, you mentioned not being able to see your son in the lead up to this. Um, so I realize you may have anticipated this, but I'd like to hear what your reaction was and maybe your families, if you care to share, uh, when the duration of the mission was extended officially and um, also what activities on the station you're looking forward to doing. Well, I think that uh, just to just to be clear, we do have uh, access to our families uh, at this point, uh, but just in the room today, with uh, uh, being everybody in quarantine, we do we don't we didn't bring our families in. I, although we we probably could have, based on them being in the same quarantine that that we are effectively. Uh, from a mission duration extension, I think that uh, it being in a summertime is. Um, um, Hopefully, if with the 27 May uh, launch date, we're kind of hitting a, a good time uh, so that I'll, my son will be able to follow the mission a little bit more closely than he would if he was uh, in school from a day-to-day -day perspective. And so I'm just uh, being really looking forward to being able to reach out to him during the mission and, and share aspects of it with him. And so that's going to be uh, pretty cool. But I think... Uh, uh, as far as heading to space station, I think our primary uh, objective is to take care of uh, getting the Dragon checked out and make sure that we can get it uh, kind of certified to move on to its next step, which is to rotate the Crew-1 guys. Uh, uh, that crew, uh, Dragon, coming pretty sh soon on the heels of our mission to do an extended duration even longer than ours on board the space station. So once we get through that piece of it, I think our next step is to try to offload Chris Cassidy on board the International Space Station. As you, uh, as you know, he's up there with uh, two cosmonauts right now, and there is a, a lot of uh, work and activity that can be done in the U.S. segment, certainly more than one person uh, can can accomplish on their own, and and certainly uh, the, uh, the spacewalks uh, is something that we would want to you know definitely have another set of hands involved with uh, to help him out when it came time to do those sorts of things. I would be you know uh, not a, a, probably a a real astronaut if I didn't uh, say I was uh, looking forward to 
the possibility of doing some spacewalks on the upcoming mission. But at the same time, I have done several spacewalks. And so I do recognize that as we lay out the, the, the mission priorities kind of going forward, our number one thing is to get uh, Dragon checked out and get ready for those uh, next crews, then to help out uh, Chris Cassidy. And then if there are some cool things that we can do and help out Space Station at the same time, like uh, those spacewalks, uh, that'll be some uh, icing on the cake for us. And uh, uh, I do look forward, if I do get that chance, for. Uh, uh, getting to tell Doug what to do uh, during the robotics operations. If uh, he's uh, flying me around on the arm, uh, it's always fun to kind of have uh, that, that, that hierarchy where you, you are the, the number one priority at a, at a given point during a spacewalk for the arm operator. And he says, he says uh, yes, sir, I think, when, uh, when you ask for something from a robotics operator. So anyway, that, that, that'll be fun, a little banter between us if we, if we get to that point in the mission. Now we'll go to Chris Davenport from the Washington Post. Oh, thanks, guys. Um, I'm just wondering, you've now got 26 days to launch. Uh, what are the upcoming, uh, this time upcoming look for you guys? And what are the biggest hurdles you have left to clear? Thanks. Yeah, I think, uh, well, there's a few things. Um, this is officially our last full week of uh, actual training. And that's a little bit of a misnomer in that we have a couple days uh, worth of training n uh, next week, and then we start uh, a, a quarantine process, which escalates as we get closer to launch. Uh, and we also get some off time to kind of get everything uh, in our lives sort of squared away since we've been you know, busy uh, getting ready for this flight and we, uh, we are likely to be in space for a few months. So, you know, as that goes along, we have a few more sims uh, with SpaceX. We'll have some proficiency sims uh, later on uh, before we go down to Kennedy. And then we'll go down to Kennedy uh, around six or seven days before launch uh, and then spend the rest of the time down there uh, prepping from that location in uh, the astronaut crew quarters down there. Uh, so uh, outside of our little world, which is exactly that, it's uh, only one small portion of this whole uh, big effort to get us launched is uh, they have uh, are trying to do the last of the uh, parachute testing today. Uh, I don't know whether they've uh, completed it yet um, as it was uh, hadn't started quite when we started this uh, press conference. And then there's some uh, a bunch of other agency level reviews uh, within NASA, the commercial crew program and, in, and SpaceX as we lead up to the uh, flight readiness review, which will be later on this month. Let's take one now from Bill Hardwood. Bill Hardwood with CBS. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Double checking, you can hear me? We can. Thanks. Hey, for either one of you, or maybe both, you know, you guys spent a lot of time back in the day practicing for shuttle aborts and paying attention to launch day weather. And your, your, your flight path and trajectory on, on the Crew Dragon flight, really, you've got abort possibilities all the way up the East Coast, obviously. And I'm just wondering, uh, you know, given the sea states and wind conditions and what the capsule can can stand up to, I'm wondering, you know, can you give us any sense of of what all has to fit together for you, for you to get clearance to launch? I mean, it strikes me that getting all that stuff to line up uh, with safe landing conditions might make it pretty darn difficult to get off the pad. So how, how do you view that, and how do you view the possibility of sitting in that capsule for many hours up the up the coast if it came down to that? Uh, before a rescue team could get to you. Sorry for the long-winded question. Thanks. No, I think, uh, Bill, you bring up a, a good point in terms of how that weather story is going to come together. You know, Doug and I were uh, down here uh, in Houston or in, in Florida watching a lot of uh, space shuttle missions try to get to get off the ground, and there were a lot of weather constraints uh, both uh, where the shuttle was. Uh, I've seen it scrubbed because of a hurricane headed to Houston, for example, and we uh, had to hunker down from a control room perspective. We've seen it scrub because of the rain in Spain as well. And so uh, that story, as it comes together, uh, uh, I know there'll be a lot of uh, management team members, uh, Steve Stitch and uh, the FOD team as well, kind of uh, having those discussions with the SpaceX team as we move forward. Our job is to really be ready when they do uh, do send us and to know what our options are once we are in orbit to, to where there is uh, good weather that we can get to and bring that capsule home should that become uh, uh, necessary. And so we've, uh, we've thought a lot about that and how we get that information information transferred to us and uh, we do know that the, the that three guys will be uh, coming to get us as, uh, as quick as they can and, and we have some insight into 
what their response times will be as we uh, uh, choose, uh, whether it's uh, escape locations uh, uh, going uphill or once we are in orbit and need to choose the, the best place uh, on the Earth's surface to come back to. And so we'll just be balancing all those things, trying to minimize that uh, part that you alluded to, which is how long we'll be in the water uh, if we did need to get picked up at some point besides a supported landing site. I'm going to take one from uh, Twitter for a moment. This one is coming from Mary. She's asking what the process of suiting up in the SpaceX suits is like and if you can compare it to the shuttle and even maybe the Soyuz suits. Yeah, that's a good question, Mary. Um, from a suit up perspective, it's similar in a lot of ways uh, that we that we did in shuttle in that it's the same exact sh suit room. Uh, it's been modified, obviously, to accommodate the SpaceX suits, but it's a similar process. You know, we'll get up in that uh, the day of launch, and we'll go through some pre-flight uh, briefings, a weather briefing, and then we'll uh, get handed off to the SpaceX folks uh, in the suit room, and we'll get our suits on. We'll do a, a leak check and a pressure check. We'll check the communication system within the uh, suit, and uh, we've got enough time in the timeline in order to troubleshoot any issues that we might have. And then, very much like we did with shuttle, we'll. Uh, walk down the hallway, get in the elevator, go downstairs and, and do our walkout, get in the vehicles and head to the pad. Um, obviously, the suit is significantly different than the suit we wore on shuttle. Um, I was fitted for a, uh, a Sokol suit, a Soyuz suit, uh, for a, a possible return on Soyuz if uh, there was an issue with 135, but I never actually went through the entire suit up process like they do in Soyuz. But it's similar in that they check the suits for leaks, they check the comm system, and they just want to make sure everything is good to go before you head out to the pad. Another one from Twitter, this one coming from Nate. Um, he's asking if you can pinpoint what you're looking forward to most about the mission. Um, for me, I'm, I'm looking forward to most uh, flying again off the, uh, the Florida coast. Uh, it'll be Pad 39 Alpha, like the one I launched on uh, uh, most recently. And so that's a, a pretty cool thing to get to do again if you get the opportunity. And uh, going back to the phone, we'll take one from Andrea Leinfelder from Houston Chronicle. Hi, um, this question is for Doug. Um, I was hoping you could elaborate a little more on how it feels to be on both the last mission and then the first one. I know you said, like, your decision was it was the right thing to do to be on this mission, but I was hoping you could elaborate a little more on just the emotions of it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I do think, um, you know, it, it's it's – People are making, you know, a bit of a deal about it, and I, and I certainly get that. But I think, you know, we as astronauts, you know, you cherish every flight assignment if you want to continue to fly in space, and I think that's the case with this one. And, and certainly it is unique, and it's the next one from uh, a United States perspective uh, since STS-135. So I think, you know, I, I try not to think about it too much because it, it, it's just – it's while it's important, I think to some degree, it's it's certainly not the focus of this mission. But uh, it, you know, I'm excited to be a part of the mission. I'm excited that I was part of STS-135. I worked very hard to 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 be an astronaut, just like every other astronaut that's ever been here. Like you know, my friend Bob sitting here, and you know, it just it worked out that way. Um, and and in a lot of ways, it just worked out that way. And. Uh, but obviously, you got to you got to work to get into a position to be selected. So, um, I think in general, you know, it's well past time to be launching an American rocket from the Florida coast to the International Space Station, and uh, I, I am certainly honored to be part of it. Okay, now we'll hear we'll hear from Russell Pounds with Pacific Rim Media. Uh, good morning. Uh, great to great to talk to you today. Uh, my my question is, uh, you know, what is the aha moment for uh, students or maybe the general business community when thinking about the value of doing uh, going to the space station? Uh, for me, the the aha moment for the the value of whether it's going to the space station or our our space program in general is is the level of excitement uh, when I reach out and kind of share the mission experience and my science and, and mathematics uh, kind of back, background, my engineering education with, uh, with school kids. And I, and I see 
the way the, the, the science tools or the educational tools can really leverage uh, uh, the things that we do in space or as a part of NASA's mission uh, with those children to get them motivated. I am a, I'm a child uh, that, that basically got inspired to, to pursue the path that I did from the, the Voyager program probably back in the day uh, to see those probes fly past the, the planets uh, going through our solar system and to you know, get the, the encyclopedia out and the annual update and read all the details and see all the, the really cool pictures that NASA was providing. And that, that created an interest in um, science and uh, engineering for me. And, and when I present and my experience and I present what we do on board the International Space Station or talk about a spacewalk to, to school kids around the country, around the world, uh, I, I see that spark get generated as well. And so th to me, that's the aha moment to, to recognize that it's, uh, that it is all worth it. Now we'll take a question from Dave Mosher from Business Insider. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, this is for whomever has the best story, I guess. Um, you both flown shuttle, as we've covered before, and Benji Reed said today that you've trained for thousands of hours in Crew Dragon. Uh, just contrasting those two experiences based on what you've seen so far, what has impressed you the most? Um, is there any aspect of the system you're, you're most excited to see? Is it the touchscreen, the, the parachutes, or maybe the toilet or something? <laughs> That's a good question. I think um, in general, it's just the collaboration that we've had over the last several years, uh, specifically with SpaceX, because that's obviously who we work with uh, primarily, but just to see the vehicle uh, essentially come from very little or a preliminary design to where it is today and the operability of the vehicle, the clean lines, how it is inside the vehicle, how it is for a crew. And uh, obviously, um, you know, we're just excited to, to kind of put it through its paces when we get ready to go fly. So um, yeah, it's just, it, it's hard to put uh, maybe into words exactly what would one specific thing, but I think just you know, going through the mission profile and, and, and kind of putting a stamp on things to make sure it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do or what we expect it to do, and then testing out all the different systems. So you know, it, it's, it's kind of a myriad of things, at least from my perspective. The, the thing that's really been the most exciting for me working with the commercial provider or with the SpaceX team in particular is just how quickly how at, what their agility is in terms of uh, reacting to uh, something that we identify as a, as an area that could be improved or some area that is a problem, uh, the way that they're able to quickly resolve it. Uh, uh, Doug and I uh, flew on shuttle missions separated by a couple of years, and uh, the changes that we saw. Uh, in that system over the couple of years that uh, we went from our first mission to our second mission, um, we couldn't get probably the same level of change that we can get in a month uh, from the SpaceX team during the couple of years that it was between our, our shuttle flights. And so it's been really exciting to, to see that. Uh, I'm hopeful that nothing comes up uh, during the mission that requires uh, that level of uh, agility, but I, I am su super confident that if anything does, that this team has that, that agility and they'll be able to uh, almost fix it real time, uh, make some changes, and uh, you know, if we really need it, make a change between uh, ascent and entry of the of the vehicle, which uh, would be a, would be a trick with a, a space shuttle, even over the two years that we saw from from mission to mission. So that agility, it doesn't quite answer the question. Uh, I hope I don't have to see it. Uh, that that agility in response to a, an issue uh, uh, during our mission, but uh, we've seen it during the development process, and I, I know they could execute it if we needed them to. And and while we were in orbit. Okay, we'll go to Marcia Smith next uh, with Space Policy Online. Uh, thanks so much. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, I'm uh, curious about how you as astronauts perceive the safety of this system compared to the shuttle since you've flown on the shuttle. You know, you have a pad abort capability with this that you didn't have with shuttle, but you're splashing down in the ocean, which presumably has a different set of risks than landing on a runway. So from an end-to-end -end mission perspective, how would you personally characterize the difference in safety between Crew Dragon and Shuttle? Yeah, I think it's a, 
a great question. You know, we've talked about it a little bit, and I'm sure the previous uh, briefings talked about it to some degree. You know, the, the thing for me is this vehicle has end-to-end -end abort capability, you know, on the pad all the way up to orbit. And so that, that perspective for me is, is huge um, compared to shuttle where there were what we called black zones where there were scenarios where it didn't really matter if you had the right combination of failures, you were likely not going to survive uh, an abort. So um, that in and itself, and as I talked about a little bit earlier, the capsule design generically is a, is a safer design than the wing vehicle uh, under most circumstances. So I think those two for me are probably the biggest uh, reasons. Now I will add that you know it is the first flight with crew. It's the second flight of the vehicle, so you know the statistics will tell you that's riskier than say the 15th flight or 20th flight of the vehicle. But uh, I am confident in in both the SpaceX and NASA teams, and we've looked at all the stuff that we need to look at, and uh, when we're ready to launch, uh, we'll go do it. I think another piece to add to that is the just the size of the vehicles. And so the space shuttle, you know, it, it was 10 times larger in terms of mass that you needed to get into low Earth orbit. And so you could have a, a lot smaller rocket, which just in and of itself, not taking the, the payload uh, and the entire vehicle that can carry a payload with you into orbit provides uh, an extra measure of safety as well. So flying on a smaller rocket really focused on the, the crew mission of, of transporting the crew versus what shuttle did, which was both take the payload and the crew into orbit, uh, provides another, another level of safety that I, I think is a, is a big factor for us as well. Okay, now we're going to go to Jim Siegel with NASA Tech. Call, can you hear me? We can. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I wanted to go back to the, uh, to the touchscreen controls that you have. Um, Normally, people uh, are used to a tactile feel in their controls, for example, driving a car or even flying an airplane. But it, my perception is that when you use this touch screen, you, you're, you have little, if any, tactile response when you uh, do something. Is that true? And what's, what's your comments about that? Well, it's, it's not exactly true. I, I kind of get where you're going as far as actual physical feedback you, you certainly don't get that from the touch screen, but what you do get is you get an indication of where you touched, and it highlights, uh, and, and that's part of the process of flying the vehicle manually is, is you're going through that to ensure that, okay, I touched that button, which makes the vehicle go up, and I got the return flash that that's what the vehicle recognized as my input. And so um, it obviously is a little bit different than what we're used to traditionally. And, and so from a training perspective, it, did it take a little more time to get used to th that way of flying a vehicle? Certainly, but it, it, it wasn't anything that became completely objectionable or was extremely difficult to do, especially given, as Bob mentioned earlier, the, the type of mission that we're trying to do manually, which is potentially finish off a, a docking sequence or an approach and docking sequence that we couldn't do from an automated uh, perspective. And, and so in that particular mission uh, event, you know, it is much more than adequate to, to accomplish the mission. And, and that's kind of why we were in the loop for all that testing to start with is, you know, can we do this? Can we accomplish this uh, with this type of control scheme? And, and the answer is yes. And we'll test it again on orbit for real. Now we'll go to Kenneth Chang from the New York Times. Hi, uh, this is for Doug, another STS-135 question. Um, you'll be walking out to the same launch pad again, 39A, but everything's changed. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how NASA's changed and how life has, as an astronaut has changed over the last nine years. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a great question. It's It's been a, a you know, there have been definite phases of how uh, not only the astronaut office, but each one of us individually that have been there since the end of the shuttle program to now, and, and just how the agency has uh, adjusted to this new uh, type of you know, contract and the way we're going to fly these vehicles and letting the private companies uh, build them. Uh, it's all kind of a little bit different, and, and so it's been kind of uh, one step at a time over the last eight and a half, nine years uh, in that regard. 
the plan was actually set in motion uh, prior to even the last shuttle flight uh, going up. So, um, yeah, it's been it's been interesting because I think, you know, as you might expect, and I and I saw it during the uh, post flight of STS 135. It's just like, you know, we would be asked questions along the lines of, well, the space program's over because the shuttle's not flying, and that certainly was not the case. We've had people on board the. Uh, International Space Station since the fall of 2000, and we continued to fly to the space station on uh, Soyuz uh, vehicles. And so part of it was just a lack of understanding, you know, by the public as far as what we were continuing to do as an agency, but it was also the time it took to develop new vehicles in order to take their place, uh, take the shuttle's place uh, to get folks to and from the International Space Station from the United States. So. You know, we just worked through that process. We saw the astronaut office uh, kind of reduce itself in size over those years. We saw the changes uh, brought on board with our folks exclusively flying on Soyuz and the amount of training and the time uh, that they had to travel uh, overseas for that training since we were flying on uh, Russian rockets. And then the development of uh, both the Starliner and the Crew Dragon uh, systems to uh, you know, get us to the point where we're at now, where we're getting ready to fly uh, back to space station from Florida. So, you know, it's it's been a, a long process in a lot of ways, but uh, in many ways, to develop a spacecraft uh, in 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 that amount of time is really not that long. It's a it's a lot of work, and it, and it and it does take time to make sure the system is exactly the way you need it to be in order to do the mission. Take one now from Sean Costello with Space Flight Insider. Thank you. Uh, question for each of you. Bob, first, if you don't mind, can you speak to the in-person uh, training that has been undertaken, certainly uh, internationally speaking, on the extension of your flight plan? So now that you'll be on uh, Space Station, as far as robotics, have you been able to travel to? Have you needed to travel to the Canadian Space Agency for refresher? Um, can you speak to your training on that, please? Well, one of the uh, challenges that we faced is, is how close to our launch date uh, the decision was made to uh, extend our mission. Luckily, based on our previous uh, shuttle flights, uh, both Doug and I have a pretty uh, extensive experience, uh, both with the international partners and, of, of course, with the, uh, the space station systems. And so whether it's uh, Doug and his experience with uh, putting together and operating uh, the Japanese uh, robotic arm. They're not, they're not planning to ask us to do this uh, during the mission, but we're familiar with, uh, with that hardware. Our shuttle missions uh, uh, took up a lot of it and uh, assembled it, in, in my case, the SPDM, Dexter, on board the International Space Station. So I had previously gone to Canada for that training when we built that. Previously, both of us uh, had visited Canada for the SSRMS training as well, and uh, Doug's been able to leverage that previous experience to get uh, uh, requalified relatively expeditiously. Uh, we did both uh, travel to uh, Cologne and get trained on the European uh, uh, portion of the International Space Station, as well as uh, travel to Moscow and to, on to Star City to get some training uh, with respect to the Russian segment as well. We did all of those things even when the mission was uh, uh, relatively short and then tried to leverage it here in the end game to, to really get uh, qualified uh, to take on the role of an extended duration mission. So I, I, it's kind of awkward to call it a long duration mission because I think some folks that, that do six months missions might take exception to us or calling our, our six weeks or, or eight weeks or 12 weeks the same as their six months or 11 months or 12 months of, uh, in some cases. And so uh, we'll be ready for that mission. We've, we'll leverage the previous experience that we've had and, and, and we've had it with all the uh, international partners uh, I think both of us have been to, to SCUBA as well at some point uh, from a training perspective uh, as part of our shuttle missions. And so while it wasn't necessarily in the last uh, couple of months, we've, uh, we've touched all those bases at some point and, and, and we'll take advantage of that once we get to station. Okay, we are just about out of time, but we're going to squeeze in one more question from Michael Sheets with uh, CNBC. Hi, guys. Thanks. Um, I have a question, given your experience, uh, especially as professional astronauts who have spent thousands of astronauts, uh, thousands of hours uh, training for this mission. Um, firstly, what do you think of the uh, SpaceX's goal of sending non-professional astronauts, private paying customers on a flight 
in a year or two after you guys? And secondarily, um, what, given that you're going to spend maybe a day or two inside the capsule itself, uh, what does the, the toilet look like on board? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's part of this industry that's, that's growing every day, whether it's suborbital or orbital flight you know, trying to get more people into space and access to space. And I think it's amazing. Everybody, uh, you know, when they come back from a mission, you know, just that look out the window alone is worth is worth going in a lot of people's minds. And, um, you know, I, I just think it's 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 what we want to have happen is the access, especially to low Earth orbit, needs to get greater and less expensive. And I think this is kind of part of that uh, exercise. And you know, as far as your second question, the toilet, uh, we'll let you know how it works out. They have one. We're going to, we'll try it out and uh, we'll let you know when we get back. Okay, I'm afraid that's all we're going to have time for today, but thanks so much to everyone for all the great questions. I know you'll want to follow along with Bob, Bob, Bob and Doug on their missions, and you can do so via social media. Doug is on Twitter at astro underscore Doug and on Instagram at astro dot Doug. And Bob is on Twitter at AstroBankin, all one word. And if that's still not enough for you, both will be answering questions via an Instagram Live today on the main NASA Instagram account at NASA at 3.55 p.m. Central, 4.55 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you'll be back here with us on NASA TV for launch on May 27th. <laughs>